This is exactly right. And welcome to my favorite murder, the mini-sode this of a lifetime, of, a, of the hour, <laughs> of the lifetime, of your dreams, of your nightmares. Um, this is the one where you email us uh, your hometown murders, your creepy stories, things in walls, fascinating grandparents, whatever you need to tell us that you know we'll like, and mm-hmm. we read it on the uh, air. Yep, on on air, live on the air, live on the air. No Ooga. edits. <laughs> <laughs> ooga, ooga. Um, um, I actually yeah. have a very important corrections corner that I know we don't do that on mini sodes, but I'm going to do it on this one, and then I'm going to do it on our Thursday show. <laughs> Is it about a guy named Johnny? It's a guy about a guy named Jimmy Summerhill. <laughs> Jimmy. <laughs> it's about a conversation George and I were having oh about my. pedophiles in England, God. and uh, <laughs> because it was off of that and georgia said what's the name of that guy and of course i always want to be the person that knows the name of the guy and i'm always so impressed with how you know every name so i mean it was like yes moving on yeah we did it and um jimmy somerville the name that i named is the lead singer uh or the singer from the communards and the bronski beat an amazing musician and performer and a, a lovely person according to all the tweets i've been getting oh, about the mistake so, i made so and how awesome he is which actually there's a really good video of jimmy somerville he walks by as a busker is singing his song and he stops and sings along with the guy oh my God. and somebody sent it to us i've seen it on the internet we'll put it on the um twitter Great. page jimmy savile was the horrifying pedophile um <laughs> that bbc dude or- <laughs> yes weird oh. uh presenter that was a super creep so so sweet one, baby angel by all accounts jimmy somerville one billion apologies to jimmy pedoph- somerville <laughs> Please stop repeating that I said that. And don't ever tell him. <laughs> oh my gosh. This will be repeated on the on the main episode. I, Hilarious. It's just not fair. <laughs> There's no fact check. I was so right in that moment. Oh, I was, I was so like, right. Oh, you're so good at this. Yes. Uh, Moving on. There was t- there's a vill in there. It sounded right to me. There were both S's, Vills, and Jimmy's. What do you want? That's as close as it's gonna get on this Come podcast. On. Hey, let me read your story. Please Let's change do. the subject. Good good idea. <laughs> okay, this is called no, wait, I can't tell you what it's called, but I think you'll like it. Okay. Greetings, MFM crew. Great. My name is Addison, and I'm 13 years old. Uh-oh, Addison. <laughs> Bad girl. Uh, <laughs> and proud member of the fan cult. You guys have made my long car rides to soccer tournaments oh. and flying driving to see family so much easier. My mom got me hooked on you on you guys, and now you're the only podcast I listen to. Addison. We're, we're popular with the kids. <laughs> we're popular. Oh, with the what generation is that? Called? I think it's Generation Fuck now, <laughs> isn't it? Um, you brought my mom and I closer than ever, so thank you. <laughs> yes, the estrangement from being twelve to being thirteen—it is actually the worst time oh, with are you your kidding mom. Me? I fucking hated my mom. Junior high, Addison, we're so with you in your junior high life. Uh, uh, we know how it feels. The hormones, Addison. You don't even know that it's not even your fault. It's please know it's not your fault. It gets better. You're gorgeous. Uh, I live in Lethbridge, a somewhat small town in southern Alberta. I live in a modern suburban neighborhood with a lot of playgrounds. I know a child's dream. Uh oh, Addison <laughs> Sassy. When I was around nine years old, when she was a kid, my sister and I were playing on one of the playgrounds. All of a sudden, two girls came up to us and asked if we wanted to play grounders with them. My sister and I said yes. That must be a Canadian thing. Sure. Uh, and we had a great time. Later that day, we. We found out that they lived right across the street. My sister didn't like them, but I did. <laughs> I would go over to their house regularly. The first time I went to their house, I was told that I wasn't allowed in the basement, but being a nine-year-old, I just brushed it off. The parents of the two kids were pretty sketchy, but again, being a stupid nine-year-old, I just brushed it off. After having after hanging out with these girls for a while, we stopped hanging out until they got three kittens. <laughs> I get it. Now, thinking back on it, uh, it was kind of rude only hanging out with them because they had kittens, but hey, who wouldn't? 
that's right. Later that week, I was stupid and said something to hint to them that I was only hanging out with them to play with the kittens. The older sister got really mad and we stopped hanging out. About two years later, I was home alone and saw blue and red lights outside my window. The police being a crime obsessed 11 year old. I was too scared to go ask what was happening. So I just quietly sat and watched from my room (laughs) later. uh, I saw the mom and dad come out of the house in handcuffs. (gasps) Curious of what happened, I went to my neighborhood group chat and asked what happened. No one knew. Later on the city news, uh, all was revealed why they had been so sketchy and why I wasn't allowed in the basement. And this is all caps. They had a goddamn meth lab in the basement. (laughs) I was kind of shocked. Anyway, stay sexy. And if people say you're not allowed in the basement, get the hell out of there. Addison. Yeah, Addison, that's right. Addison, you're smart. You're smart beyond your 13 years <laughs> and my 13 years at that age, too. Jesus Christ. <laughs> we need to, Addison, tell your mom we need to talk to her really quick. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not going to read you the subject line of this. It's a, okay. It the subject line was a meth lab across the street. Right. Was the yeah. subject line. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, hey, Karen, Georgia, Stephen, and associated furry friends. Uh, when I was a naive college student in Los Angeles back in the 90s, hey, my roomies and I won the lottery to move to off-campus housing for our junior year. I was particularly excited because I got to move in by myself over the summer because I had an internship in the university publications office. Feeling very grown up and independent Mm -hmm. i settled in and selected the bedroom that didn't share a wall with the neighbor smart he was in his 20s didn't go to my school enjoyed loud music and seemed to sleep in the day and be up late at night sometimes people left packages at his doorstep and it wasn't ups he was always (laughs) friendly though and told me to let him know if his music ever bothered me my roommates moved in just before school started and immediately started griping about all the music volume just tell him to move his stereo he's a nice guy i said all three stared at me like i was insane i'm not talking to him he's a drug dealer my roommate tessie said oh my roommate tessie said well tessie could be pretty snap judgment dish so I rolled my eyes and asked him to turn down the music myself he was very nice and understanding and we had no other problem until a few weeks later one night I was working on a a late deadline in the student publications office when I got a phone call from Tessie who sounded seriously irritated but it was something else that caught my attention what are all those male voices I asked curiously oh that would be the SWAT team Tessie said (laughs) you know that nice neighbor well he had over 400 guns in his apartment he's an armed dealer oh my god (laughs) i didn't think the timing was right to point out that i was right about the fact that he wasn't a drug dealer (laughs) um my blood still runs cold when i consider that i had been there all summer by myself while my neighbor was merrily merrily arming the neighborhood oh my god stay sexy and be suspicious of accommodating neighbors who keep strange hours barbara oh uh, the arms dealer is the last thing i would have thought yeah that seems like real risky to just keep guns in your house. 400, 400, 400 of them. guns. Those don't like, you know, they're not compact. Well, maybe, I don't know. I don't, I mean, yeah, that's, it's all, it's, he's really rolling the dice there. Yeah. And it didn't work out. It turns out it didn't. Turns out. Turns out crime does not pay <laughs> for long. Um, okay. I'm not going to read you the name of this one. <laughs> right. Ready? Okay. Hello, Karen, Georgia, Steven, and pets. This is a story about the length my grandparents went for their growing family. My grandparents lived in the same house since they had gotten married in the early 50s. It started out as a two-bedroom house, which was fine for them and my dad. That was until my grandmother became pregnant with my aunt. My grandfather didn't know what to do since they lived off his salary as a construction worker. In comes his older brother, who worked in the local train yard and suggested that they steal from a lumber shipment that had just come in the day before. <laughs> sure. That's a great idea. His older brother worked at night, worked at night shift and my grandfather quote, borrowed a flatbed truck from the job site. Along with his baby brother to help, the older brother opened the gate to the train yard in the late hours of the night. They loaded the truck with as much lumber as they could and then drove off without being seen. Ooh. They split the loot three ways. The older brother used it to uh, burn. The baby brother built a patio. And this sounds like a fairy tale. And my grandfather built a three-bedroom addition along with a rec room. <laughs> Oh, my God. Um, This apparently happened before the 60s, and none of my aunts and uncles knew about it until after my grandfather had his stroke and his filter went away. Oh. (laughs) He he spilled the beans in 2016, and my grandmother confirmed it, saying, I never thought he would let that one slip. (laughs) 
<laughs> we were all impressed with how long they kept that secret. He said that he was so worried about getting caught that he built the addition really quickly. That's why the ceilings in the upstairs bedrooms were so low. The ceiling fan would hit me in the head and why some of the steps on the stairs were higher than others. Unfortunately, my grandpa- my grandmother passed away in September of last year, and my grandfather followed before Christmas. They were both wonderful people whose ill-gotten addition allowed them to grow their family and also become foster parents. Oh, they gave back. That's right. Uh, my girlfriend and I love your show, and I hope to see you live if you ever come to Ottawa or Montreal. SSCGM, Dennis. Amazing. Love it. That actually reminds me of a story. Um, my friend Mick, who was from the East End of London, mm-hmm. his father was a tile worker Uh and he got a job um retiling a bathroom in the in the buckingham palace (gasps) and so they were in there doing it and every day that he would go in and work he would take like 20 tiles of his own and then he he retiled their bathroom in their (gasps) apartment and on the east end so they had they they had one bathroom they called the royal bathroom because it was it was the exact same tile as the bathroom in the palace that's that's amazing don't tell anybody that we don't want to we don't want to bust those people unless that if that's traceable but that is my favorite fucking story because it's like so good they're the ones there putting in the elbow grease totally i mean and the mechanism is like what is it going to be a couple they don't give a tiles? single shit please Come steal on. shit it's fine except for our arms guns <laughs> our gun dealers guns. Uh, okay with America's number one meal kit, HelloFresh, you'll get easy seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door. All you have to do is cook and enjoy. HelloFresh makes cooking delicious meals at home a reality. From step-by-step recipes to pre-measured ingredients, you'll have everything you need to get a wow-worthy dinner on the table in about 30 minutes. Say goodbye to endless grocery store trips and takeout. HelloFresh has you covered. There's something for everyone from family recipes to calorie smart and vegetarian and fun menu series like Hall of Fame and, and Craft Burgers. HelloFresh has more five-star recipes than any other meal kit, so you'll know you're getting something incredible. HelloFresh is flexible and it fits your lifestyle, easily change your delivery days, food preferences, and skip a week whenever you need. Break out of your dinnerette and make deliciousness part of every week with HelloFresh. I love that even though HelloFresh is super easy and they make it really basic and like straightforward, you still feel like you're cooking this like incredible home cooked dinner. And that makes me feel good about myself. And that instead of just ordering takeout, I'm actually making something and preparing something at home. And that just, it feels good. So for $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash Murder80 and enter Murder80. It's like receiving eight meals for free only at HelloFresh.com slash Murder80, promo code Murder80. Go by. Okay. Again, let's just not read subject line Great. this time. Georgia Karen Stephen and Four Legged Friends. I was listening a few uh, to a few minisodes that mentioned a serial masturbator and something about Venice. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> no, that's Swiss cheese. Um, I freaked out when I realized that I finally had something to send you guys. In May of 2017, I was traveling through Europe alone at the ripe age of 20. Unfortunately, I hadn't found the MFM podcast yet, uh, which may have helped me be less of a dumbass in situations like these. Uh-oh. Anywho, I was I took a weekend trip to Venice and spent two days getting lost in the streets and eating a sickening amount of pasta. Mm. Oh, that's my dream. Uh, it was one of the most magical places I'd ever visited. My train was scheduled to depart at 1 p.m., so I made my way to that side of the city early so I didn't have to rush. I found this cute little park and felt like I was living my best life, uh. eating biscotti and reading a book on a bench in Venice. That sounds amazing. At 20. And don't forget you're 20. You're 20. Like best time of your life. I took off my glasses, which I need if I want to see more than two feet in front of my face. Uh, I felt pretty safe because there, because there were families walking d- their dogs and other people sitting on benches in the park. As I'm sitting peacefully reading and minding my own damn business, I hear a rustling in the bushes. I figured it was some kind of rodent or birds or whatever, and I didn't bother putting on my glasses. But then I realized that the sound wasn't stopping and it was very consistent. Uh, I got an uneasy feeling and proceeded to put my glasses back on. Mistake. <laughs> Maybe 20 feet in front of me I see a man standing near a tree staring at me in the eyes and furiously masturbating 
Naturally, I freaked out and threw all my stuff in my backpack backpack and ran the fuck out of there. You guys are the first people I've ever told this story because I think my friends would find it more horrifying than entertaining. Oh my God. (laughs) I don't get freaked out very easily, so I just brushed it off in the moment. Thinking back on it now, I really hope that dude didn't scare some little girl who's just trying to have a good time in the park. I don't know what else I could have done in the moment because my Italian is not good enough (laughs) to have that kind of discussion with the police. Well, when in Rome, I guess. Thanks for making this dope podcast. Maybe I'll be ready the next time some old dude is being an asshole in public stay sexy and don't let old venetian men use your use your for sexual gratification oh, caroline oh the, the I didn't, eye looking the in the eye directly in the eye but also that he was old oh god i didn't really pick up on that until the uh, very end yeah that's not good an old creepy masturbator uh, he's probably looking at her being like that looks like the best he's masturbating over the best day that she's having <laughs> he's so jealous that she gets to be 20 oh my god you're yeah you're your high class lifestyle is giving me a boner oh, that I have to what take a care creep. of. All right, I have one more. Addison, I hope you didn't hear that part. God damn it. Addison. Addison. Okay, I'm not going to read you the name of this one. Hello, ladies, cats, dogs, and Steven. Uh, your recent episode about the boys on the tracks reminded me of when I was eight years old and found myself in the middle of a drug drop zone. I thought you'd want to hear about it. Yes. It was 1979, and me, my mom, stepdad, and cat were living on a sailboat. Um, that wow. sounds amazing. Okay. I'm Everyone's a cat with a boat. So much glamour on this mini set. Seriously. My stepdad was a boat builder and quite the seafarer. So, so much so that we sailed our boat from Miami to the Bahamas. Wow. One day we were sailing from one island to another, just enjoying the sun and crystal clear water when boom, we felt something hit the boat. You know, what's really weird is I'm literally listening to a book that is that the it is about this is like the topic. Wait, let me say what the book is real quick so people can read it. OK, it's uh, something in the water by Catherine Stedman when they find something while they're like boating. And it's similar. Amazing. Sorry. Go on. <laughs> no, I'm reading. Okay. Felt something hit the boat. Knowing there was no rocks or other boats in sight, we couldn't imagine what it was. My stepdad leaned over the side of the hull and grabbed onto the huge wooden crate that was bobbing along in the water. Ooh. He pried the top off and the crate was full of weed. What? My stepdad estimated that was probably worth $25,000. Uh, my parents argued back and forth over whether to keep it or not. <laughs> my stepdad claiming that we could be set. And my mom stating that someone will come looking for that. Mm-hmm. At eight years old, I had no idea what weed was, but judging by my parents' reaction, I assumed we had just won the lottery. <laughs> I began fantasizing about all the Barbies uh, and candy I would buy. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd want to buy, too. That's right. Uh, my mom won the argument, and my stepdad let go of the crate and grumbled. We'll never have that up, op- and we'll never have another opportunity like that again in our lifetime. <laughs> he barely got the words out before, boom, <laughs> another crate of weed hit our boat. <gasps> again. The- <laughs> <laughs> again, the arguing ensued, and again, my mother won. I don't. That would be so hard to turn down, right? I don't know though, because that is she, the mother's right. You're yeah. you're inviting either you're going to get yeah. put in jail because they they think the drug drop drug drop was for your boat, right? Or there's going to be drug dealers who well, are like they didn't know it was a drug drop. Hold on, I should finish this. Okay. <laughs> About ten minutes later, a speedboat came racing towards us from one of the islands. My parents thought for sure that it was the owner of the weed and that we were about to be in deep shit. Luckily, it was a sweet native man who warned us that we were in the middle of a drug zone <laughs> or a drop zone and get the hell out of there because the drug runners were watching us with binoculars from the nearest island. Yes. <gasps> Apparently, planes would drop the crates and current and the current would move them between the islands. We think the man pulled our sail down put the engines into high gear and hauled ass out of there yes stay sexy and keep out of drop zones can't wait to see you in san francisco linda that's think oh yeah you know what that's the thing to think of is what if you're being watched yeah what if you're being watched by the worst case scenario person that could be watching well, you all i can think of now when i hear of someone finding shit like that like and the thing is when you're finding drugs it's different because then you have to sell them to make any money and it's like you know yeah. how much you don't do that but there's then, all kinds of ways to get fucked up from in this book something in the water they find something else and it's all i can think about is like remember in the movie um uh where that he finds the the movie with josh Jimmy brolin <laughs> <laughs> josh brolin he finds no a bunch of money for old men. thank you and there's like a tracker in the money of course there's a tracker yes that's all i can think of course there's a tracker yeah of course there's someone watching from another island yeah when it's like that much yeah it's not like you found a suitcase of pot you found a crate of totally pot. two 
Yeah. Oh, thank God the mom too. is smart. Okay. Right? Thank God for moms. Okay, here's our last one. Okay. Um, I th- I'm going to save this subject line for you because you're going to like this one a okay. lot. Okay, okay, okay. I'm so excited. Dear Georgia, Karen, Stephen, and Pets, longtime listener, first time writer in her. <laughs> now that you guys um, are just reading anything cool, <laughs> I thought I'd share this fun fact about Stephen King and a prison here in Maine. <gasps> I'm a law student in my first year of school here in Maine, and I've lived for uh, where I've lived for eight years. Stephen King grew up in Durham, the town next to my town, although he now has a residence up in Bangor. Uh, it's said that the town influenced um, the settings for The Body, a.k.a. Stand By Me, and It. And yeah, the influence is pretty obvious to those who've been there. Being a third-year law student is... Um, Oh, part of being a third, third year law student is that you can get sworn in to practice law if you have a supervising attorney who will let you practice under their bar number. I was lucky enough to land a job at our school's coveted legal aid clinic. And for the past few months, I've been making weekly trips to the local prison to assist prisoners with legal needs. The prison has operated since 1919 wow. and houses around 700 prisoners. I have to wait for the guards to buzz me through about five gates on my journey through the sally port and the yard, which always makes me feel exposed and uneasy Yay. until I get to my destination, the prison library. The prison library is a protected, quiet place that I can meet with my prisoner clients. It has its own real librarian, not a prisoner, walls of new magazines, wow. and enough rows of books to read resemble a shabbier, slightly more grim, independent hipster bookstore. And when you walk in, there's an unassuming plaque posted about waist high that declares the library to be a gift of Stephen and Tabitha King. Cell phones are not allowed in prisons under penalty of death or I'd send you a photo. (laughs) Startled, I asked my supervising attorney about the plaque. A white-haired old-timer who knows everyone and everything, my supervisor told me that King donated the library because he wanted prisoners to practice literacy, not be bored, hello, prison and since the prison setting in Shawshank Redemption netted him so much <gasps> he wanted to give back to Maine prisons the old Maine prison which actually influenced King for Shawshank closed in 2002 I, tr- uh, I tried to find out more information on the internet about his motivations for the gift but only found silence the Kings do operate a foundation that awards grants for libraries around the state however I could not find any mention of um, the prison in their many proud press releases of grants to colleges, local libraries, medical centers, etc. Wow. It seems that the prison library is a little Easter egg that King planted, known only to those who pass inside the prison walls. Wow. Thanks for the podcast. I wish I could share more stories with you. And yes. boy, oh boy, do I have some. <laughs> but confidentiality, privilege, and professional ethics prevent me from doing so. Keep up the great work. And I hope someday that you do a show up here in Maine. Yes. Jamie Lynn. Oh my God. Isn't that the fucking greatest? That's amazing. Amazing, Stephen and Tabitha King. Yes, and on the heels of that, I, we we should say this: a bunch of people have been recommending this podcast. I don't think we've talked about it. Um, there's a new podcast called Ear Hustle, and it is um, produced and hosted by um, uh, guys that are in San Quentin. <gasps> And I it's didn't know this. Amazing! It's amazing. I listened to it um, a couple days ago, and it's just stories about guys that are in there, and the hosts are really interesting and funny. And some, it's some obviously some of it's really sad and really upsetting, but it's called Ear Hustle. You have to listen to it. Holy it's like shit. it's a very. Um, I re- I think it's very fascinating the way like prison reform and stuff like all these things are coming up yeah. culturally right now that are so important and it's it's such a great idea. I have a feeling Phoebe Judge, ha- Judge has something to do with this podcast. I was going to say that sounds not unlike a, fee- a, a criminal I style. think it's it might be from Radiotopia. Okay. I could be wrong but I think it is and it's just so good and the stories are so fascinating I'm sure. and some of them are heartbreaking and you, you should listen to it. Ear hustle. It's a good way to make to make the like prisoners who aren't there for you know violent offenses have kind of a we see them as humans instead of just prisoners that's exactly right and also the people who are there that should not be there at all right oh my like God. we all everybody likes to think you know You're they in the like right to, place it, it's yeah. easy to to just generalize and then kind of put it out of your mind yeah. and i think it's very humanizing and it's important and cool yeah I yeah. love that. That's great. Yeah. Um, and we love Stephen King. We, How badass love, is that? He is an angel baby. And On so top of the fact that he wrote all of Cujo Blackout Drunk. That's right. Which is the most amazing. That's one of uh, Jesse Pop's jokes. Yes, is that that's right. He said it, it's in his, uh, Jesse Pop, our friend who's a comedian, has an album of comedy and it has a joke about Stephen King writing Cujo Blackout Drunk. Yep. And the only thing that 
Jesse's ever done when he's blackout drunk is wake up next to a tub of vegan pasta salad <laughs> from the bodega that he must have bought when he was blackout drunk. <laughs> um, yeah, amazing. Yeah. Uh, so go, yeah, email us at my favorite murder at Gmail. Email us your, your weird blackout drunk stories. Yeah, those are great. Yeah. And, um, um, uh, or sad. Or sad. And stay sexy. And don't get murdered. Goodbye. Goodbye. Elvis, you want a cookie? Hey, Elvis, you want a cookie? Wow. <laughs>